Yeah, so I'm going to talk about some of the uh, privacy research that the uh, CUPS lab is doing, um, just to give you an idea of the extent of the CUPS lab. Uh, we took this photo a few months ago, and this is um, mostly the students in the CUPS lab. Uh, there's actually some other faculty uh, who are affiliated with the CUPS lab as well. So you can see we have a, a pretty large group. Um, uh, these are all people who are interested in basically the human factors um, associated with privacy and security. And we have a, uh, a weekly um, lunch seminar. Uh, where, where we talk about these things. We have some guest speakers, we have student presentations. Um, so kind of a growing interest in this area. Um, before I get started, I also want to mention uh, our new Privacy Engineering Master's program at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, we just welcomed our first class uh, this fall. Um, so we have um, our, our first eight students in the program. Um, this is a, a one-year master's program for uh, people with technology backgrounds who would like to become privacy engineers. So uh, I'd be happy to talk more about that with anybody who's interested later. Okay, so now to the, uh, the true topic of this talk. Um, so we've been looking at online behavioral advertising. And so uh, for those of you who are not, not sure quite what that is, um, so I'm gonna walk you through an example. Um, so here we have Johnny who's on the screen here and you can tell from the look on his face that Johnny has a problem. And uh, so Johnny uh, goes to WebMD to try to get some advice to solve his problem. Um, and uh, while he's there, there's, there's some ads on, on WebMD and there are some cookies. And so they're, they're collecting some information about him um, and they're storing in his profile that he's visited WebMD. Uh, so then Johnny does a search. Um, seems his problem is related to his scalp. Um, so he does, he does a search on scalp conditions and uh, that gets noted by the ad network as well. Um, so then later in the day, uh, Johnny is going to buy some airline tickets and he's on Expedia and he gets some ads for dandruff shampoo. Okay, and he, he's, a, he's a bit surprised. How did, how did they know that I have this problem? All right, well this, this is online behavioral advertising that basically you have the, the um, advertising companies are tracking what you're doing across different websites and they're using that to target ads to you on yet another website. So um, Johnny finds that there are some benefits uh, to this system. Um, he gets ads that are more relevant to things he's interested in. It helps him find things of interest. It helps personalize his internet experience. And he was actually pretty pleased to get a, a discount on that dandruff shampoo. Uh, so, so that was all pretty good. Uh, but he also has some concerns about this. Uh, he's wondering, you know, what other information did they collect about him? What, what else do they know about him? Um, how exactly did they get all this information? Um, are they making any um, uh, inaccurate assumptions? You know, sometimes he shops for, for products for other people in his family or friends. Um, you know, are they putting all of that into his profile? Um, and he also feels like he doesn't really have any uh, real awareness of what's going on or any control over the situation. So, so these are all concerns. Um, these concerns end up being coming um, even more of a problem because it, it turns out that, that the uh, efforts that have been put into place to give users control here um, are fairly lacking. Uh, so one type of control is something you may have heard of called do not track. Uh, so do not track is an initiative where the idea is that you should have one button in your web browser um, that you can click and get sites to stop tracking you. So here, this is um, in Firefox and it says, tell sites that I do not want to be tracked. Um, or you can say instead, tell sites that I want to be tracked. Um, or you can actually not express an opinion and it's not clear what happens then. Um, actually, it's not clear what happens no matter what you pressed here uh, because the uh, W3C has been trying to standardize what do not track means for about two years now um, and they have failed to reach any consensus. Um, so it's not really clear what this is, but it's in your web browser and you can make that decision. Um, there are some other uh, approaches to giving people uh, control. Um, so the, one of the advertising industry associations has a website where you can go and uh, choose to opt out of specific trackers, so specific companies that are going to track you. So you could go through this list and say, all right, do I want Adobe Media Op Optimizer to track me? What about AdReady? What about Aggregate Knowledge Inc? Hmm. What about Audience Science? Bizarre Voice? 
miso, blue kava, right? And the problem is, is that users go and look at that and they say, well, I've never heard of most of these companies. Like, how do I know whether I want them to track me or not? This is not useful information to make a decision. In fact, we did a study um, a couple years ago, and we uh, we gave users a specific list of, of companies and and asked them how they would decide. Um, when they saw things like um, AOL advertising in the mix, um, they would reflect on their experiences with AOL as an ISP. And those who had had bad experiences with with AOL would say, "Well, no, they shouldn't track me. They have a lousy internet service." Like these two things have something to do with each other. Um, they would see Microsoft uh, advertising, and they would say, "Well, I already bought a computer. Why?" Do I need Microsoft to advertise to me? Um, so they were not making judgments based on, on any sort of useful information um, about what the trackers were actually going to do. Um, so we've been uh, looking at what is it that users actually do when they decide what trackers to block. Um, and the, the first problem is right now, today, users have so little information um, that they're just making these decisions on kind of faulty assumptions. And so what's really more interesting is not what are users doing today, but what would a truly informed user do? If users actually understood what was going on, how would they make these decisions? Um, so in order to do this, we decided to do a study on what actually matters to users. Um, so there's a bunch of things that vary depending on which advertising company or tracker we have. Um, we can look at what type of information is collected, the extent to which that information might be shared, um, the retention period, how long they're going to keep the data. Um, maybe it has something to do with how uh, familiar the website is or how much people trust the website. Um, or maybe it has something to do with the type of control mechanisms they have. So which of these factors would actually influence users in deciding whether or not to allow the tracking? So we did a study using Amazon's Mechanical Turk. Uh, so this is a system where you can, um, you can go online and say, I have um, a small job that I'd like somebody to do, and I'm willing to pay 10 cents or a dollar or something to have people do this job. Um, and you can then recruit uh, thousands of people to do it. Uh, and you can just pay with your credit card on Amazon, and Amazon will give out the 10 cents to each person who does it. So this is great for these sorts of research studies um, where we need thousands of people to take a survey or to uh, or do small tasks as part of the study. Uh, so we were able to recruit almost 3,000 people for this um, in just a couple of weeks. Um, and uh, we came up with um, 15 different scenarios. Uh, they're all related scenarios, but they're all about um, uh, what an advertiser might do with the information that they collect through this tracking. Um, we provided a, a simulated web browsing scenario, which I'm going to show you. Um, we then explained to people what online behavioral advertising was and what the value proposition was so that they would have some understanding. Because in a previous study, we found that people had so little knowledge about it that they couldn't really even answer questions about it. Um, and then we showed them 30 types of information that a, uh, a tracker might want to collect about them and asked them how comfortable they were with each of these types of information being collected. Um, and then we gave them a bunch of different hypothetical controls and asked them if this would change their answer. So uh, we had a bunch of different treatments in our experiment. Um, the first one was website familiarity. Uh, so as I said, we, we had a web browsing scenario where we showed people a website and we said, this is the website that's going to track you. Um, and uh, then we asked the questions. Um, so in this case, we used um, WebMD as our base website. And then we had an alternative, which was WebDR. That's a name we made up. Um, and you can see we made the logo look very similar to WebMD. Um, so half of our participants saw WebMD, and you can see that looks like it. Now watch the top left corner. Half of them saw WebDR. Looked identical, except that it was WebDR. And um, just to make sure that they were paying attention and they knew that was different, um, as part of our study, we asked people how familiar they were with the website. And the WebMD people were very familiar. And the people who saw WebDR said, no, not really very familiar with this website. So it, th that, that particular um, uh, variable you know, seemed, seemed to work out pretty well. OK, so besides website familiar familiarity, we also controlled the scope of the sharing. Some people saw that their data was going to be collected by either WebMD or Web WebDR and not shared. Uh, some people saw that it was going to be shared with other websites that they were visiting. And some people saw that it was going to be shared with Facebook. Um, so th those were the, uh, the three options for the scope of sharing. 
Um, we also uh, had two options for retention period. Uh, some people saw that their data would be uh, stored for one day, and some people saw that it would be stored in indefinitely. Um, and then finally, we uh, also gave them information about their ability to access and view the data that had been collected about them. Um, and uh, some people were told that they could go and find out what data was collected about them, and other people were told that they would have no ability to access that information. Okay, so uh, we did a rather complicated analysis. We had um, 30 types of personal information were our dependent variables, and then our independent variables were different data usage scenarios. Um, we did a statistical factor analysis to group the different types of personal information into categories so that we could see uh, clusters of information and how people felt about them. Um, and then we also built a regression model to investigate what factors would affect disclosure preferences. Right? That's just a fancy way of saying that we did a lot of statistics. And so in the results that I'm going to show you, I'm going to tell you which things were actually statistically significant uh, results. Okay, so um, when we asked people how willing they were to disclose information, this is um, averaged across all conditions here. And what you can see, that red dotted line at the top, shows that for most types of information, uh, f fewer than 50% of our participants were comfortable sharing it at all. Okay, so we're starting pretty low. Pe you know, half the people just don't want to share this information. Um, then it depends on what type of information for how, th how they feel about it. So um, at the top of the spectrum, uh, people were, f were relatively fairly willing to share uh, what country they're from, what web browser they were using, their gender, their operating system, and what state they live in in the US. Um, so th those were p things people were pretty comfortable with. The opposite end of the spectrum, we see things like credit score, exact current location, phone number, address, and credit card number, people were very reluctant to share. Um, so we can see that the type of data really makes a difference in how willing uh, people are to disclose it. Okay. Um, in our cluster analysis, we came up with a bunch of different uh, types of categories. Uh, so one, fr from these 30 types of data, one category is browsing information. And so this includes things like what pages you visited, your search terms, time spent on the pages, and there were two other things as well. So those we cluster together and just call that browsing information. Um, we also had a cluster called computer information, which was just your web browser and your operating system. Uh, then we had location information, which was country, state, town, city, and zip code. This is not your exact uh, GPS location right now. This is more like the um, address information. Uh, we had uh, demographic information, which included gender, political views, income bracket, religion, sexual orientation, and, and four other things. Um, those all got grouped together. And then finally, we had personally identifiable information, which was your email address and your name. Um, so we then did the factor analysis to see how much um, the various factors we were testing impacted your willingness to disclose this information. So um, this, is, this is what it looks like. And you can see that um, on the right, the access and the familiarity with the site, whether it was the WebMD or WebDR, um, was not statistically significant for any of these categories. So these things didn't matter. People were going to share or not share, and it had nothing to do with access or site familiarity. Um, you also can see um, in the orange bar that the information about the computer, um, again, it, it made no difference. None of these factors impacted your willingness to, to share information about your computer. So the interesting part is this part over here. And where you see the check boxes, that's where we found statistically significant differences. Um, so what we see is that the scope of the sharing, are we sharing it only with M WebMD or also with Facebook and other websites, all right, that's going to impact whether or not I'm going to share browsing information, location, or PII. Um, we see that the retention period, whether it's indefinitely or one day, is going to impact whether, whether I share browsing information, location, or demographic information. Okay, so these are the things that, that actually do make a difference. I um, also want to show you some, some examples of some of the differences we saw. So in the browsing category, if we look specifically at what pages you visited, um, what we can see here is that um, when... Um, when we look at the difference between indefinitely and one day, we see that uh, for when you're visiting WebMD, you're going to be 15% more likely to share information if it's going to only be retained for one day instead of indefinitely. Um, when it's uh, visiting other, when it's shared with other sites, it's 11%. So we're seeing some actual differences there. 
We also see differences based on the extent that it's shared. So we see that, that there's people are 25% um, more likely to share if it's going to be um, uh, if it's going to be disclosed to other sites you visit than if it's going to be disclosed to Facebook. And they're even more likely if it's going to be uh, say, used only by WebMD. Uh, if we look at uh, a person's name, their, their personally identifiable information, uh, we, we also uh, see, see these sorts of trends. Um, so here, though, we see that people are more willing to share their name with Facebook than with other visited sites. Um, we suspect that's because most people have already shared their name with Facebook, and so therefore they, they don't see that as being a big deal. That said, you know, look at, look at the, um, the y-axis. We're still looking at only 20 to 25 percent of people who are saying they're willing to share there. When we look at um, how long uh, uh, they're going to retain or keep the data, um, we asked people uh, who, who we had told um, that the data would be kept for only one day, well, what if we were to change that and it was going to be one week, one month, six months, one year, et cetera? Um, and we did the same thing for the people who uh, had previously, we, we told them it would be indefinitely. Um, and what we see is that um, there, there seems to be kind of a sweet spot where people are most willing to share, and that's if data is only going to be uh, kept for kind of one day or one week. Um, now, this is something that we don't have real detailed data on because this was sort of the hypothetical afterwards, um, but it's something that I think um, deserves some, some further research. Um, there, it seems that there's definitely uh, a difference between keeping data a long time and having that short retention period. It's something that seems to make a difference to users. Now, this study does have some limitations. Um, this was a survey. This wasn't a situation where people's data was actually going to be shared or disclosed. Um, and so we know uh, that survey data is not, people don't always do exactly what they say they're going to do on a survey. Um, that said, we expect that a lot of the relative differences that we saw are probably um, uh, fairly similar to what we would see with actual behavior. Um, this was also done using Amazon's Mechanical Turk, and there are some biases with recruiting uh, Turkers because, you know, these are people who spend a lot of time online, you know, doing 10 cent jobs and you know there there is a, a demographic bias there that said we've also found for these sorts of studies that you get a reasonable representative sample of internet users in the United States. Um, we also have a limit that we were asking people only in the context of one website, a, a health-related website, and they might behave differently on different types of websites. Um, and we also uh, limited uh, the purpose of the data collection to targeted ads. We didn't say, oh, and this information will be shared with your employer, your insurance company, you know, anybody else. We said it would only be used uh, in the scope of targeted ads. Okay, so from this study, um, we draw a few conclusions. Um, one uh, big conclusion is that um, it, as we develop future tools to uh, give users notice and choice to let them control uh, the ability to um, uh, uh, block uh, this tracking, um, we need to figure out what uh, factors are actually important to users and give them controls over those factors. And so what we saw is that um, uh, the retention and the scope seem to be important factors, whereas things like uh, the ability ability to access your information were, were less important factors for people. Um, it also seems that ad companies should be more transparent about their data practices so that people are able to actually make these decisions and not have to decide just based on the name of the company. Um, this is still a really hard task for users to do. When you go to a website, uh, there's typically like 20 different companies that might be tracking you. You don't wanna have to sit there and go, okay, well, this one keeps my data for three days and this one keeps it for five days. Like This is still not a task that, that people um, are gonna wanna do, even with a nice user interface. And so having standardized um, formats for their policies and ideally machine readable format, so you can just tell your web browser, hey, if they can just keep my data for one day and they only use it for advertising, it's fine. You know, if they go for five days, no, block it. Right? You should be able to set up that policy and have it happen automatically, and that you can't do today. Um, we also think that as uh, public policymakers are debating, you know, should we have a law about do not track, what should we do, um, it's really useful for them to have data like this. And we, we think that, that rather than just kind of um, speculating about what um, American Internet users actually want, having this sort of data can really inform the public policy process. And I will take questions now. Any questions for Lori? 
You don't ask questions, I'm going to start asking you questions. <laughs> Where were you born? No. <laughs> <laughs> you do your own research for that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. you mentioned just the MTurk and surveys being different from actual data. Uh, how would you go about getting the actual data? I think people in a survey, they're more likely to do the, the righteous thing, whatever that is, or the proper thing. Mm -hmm. In real life, you know, I, I really want this, so I'm willing to sell my soul or at least my current location. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so doing these sorts of real, real life data collection um, can be very difficult. Um, I think that you know one way that you could do it is that um, if we were to build, um, say, a browser plugin that would provide some of this information. So when you went to a website, you would see in the corner of your browser, you know, there's five trackers, and this is what they do with your data. Would you like to block it? Um, we could then see how users of that toolbar, especially if they had opted into letting us collect the data about how they use the toolbar, right? Um, we'd be able to see for that sample of users what they actually are doing in, in real life. Now, it would be a small sample, I, I expect, um, you know, unless we built a really popular toolbar that you know, lots of people wanted. But it would be a small sample. It would be uh, most likely a sample of privacy-interested folks who you know, would want to go download that toolbar, um, but it would give us a way of seeing what people really do rather than what people say they're going to do. Um, so in our lab, we, we've, um, this is something that we struggle with in a lot of our research because we're so interested in human factors. Um, so uh, we did a study, uh, at this point it's about eight years ago, um, we wanted to see whether people, um, if they had more information about website privacy policies, if that would influence what websites they would purchase uh, goods from. Uh, and so we, we actually did a study. Uh, people came into the lab and we told them that they, we would give them some money to make some purchases and they would get to keep the change. Um, and some people used a search engine where they had no privacy information. And some people used our special search engine where they had privacy information in the search results. We had a meter, you know, this site has great privacy, this site has terrible privacy. Um, and we were able to demonstrate that people uh, who had that privacy information were more likely to buy from the high privacy sites even when it cost them more money. Um, which meant they had less change to keep uh, at the end of the study. Um, and, and so that, that gets you like a lot closer to what people really do rather than what people say they're going to do. Did you share the results with e-tailers? And did they think the benefit of you know, additional revenue because they had better security would offset the lost revenue of them not being able to monetize on the back end? Um, so, uh, so the, the, the paper is public, and you know we've shared it with all sorts of people. Um, the the, um, the 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 reason why uh, everybody didn't immediately take our advice and uh, and go and, and make better privacy policies, I think, is um, it's still uh, it's still a very difficult problem for people to find the sites um, that have better privacy and do that comparison shopping. Um, our search engine that we built is a little you know, research project and in, uh, we, there, there doesn't actually exist a search engine where you could see in the search results good, bad privacy, you know, right, right then and there. So the reality is that even if a company says, hey, we have great privacy, you know, let's say you're buying shoes online and you're like, oh, we are the privacy shoe store, right? Um, it's going to be very difficult for people to figure out which is really the privacy shoe store to find out if the other shoe store is really that much worse in, in their privacy. Um, so that there is a, a lot of costs in, in reading the privacy policies. Um, you know, if you just wanted to compare the privacy policies of two shoe stores, you you might spend an hour doing that. Like, who's going to do that while they're buying stuff online? You know, it's it, it's just um, it's just too difficult for people to do that. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>